Construction is now underway on a revolutionary billion dollar expansion project called Iberg. Eight man-made islands covering nearly two square miles with 18,000 new homes and 150 that float, creating the largest designed floating community in the world. And for the first time in the city's history, all 45,000 residents will live above sea level with floating houses unlike any before. Designed to be buoyant using the exact same principle as ships. You're probably asking yourself, why is it that this big, heavy concrete foundation doesn't just sink when it gets into the water? The answer is Archimedes, the famous Greek mathematician who proved the Archimedean principle, which basically says the following. If the weight of the water displaced by an object, which in this case is all the water that would have been in this void, is equal to the weight of the object, which in this case is the house, then you have positive buoyancy. In other words, your house will float. In floating homes, the basement is also a hull, so a single crack could sink the house. So to stay afloat, they build it without a single joint by pouring all four walls and the floor in one shot, making it an impermeable, monolithic concrete hull. The crew has just one shift to pour the entire 18 by 36 foot hull. To do this, the factory uses a special tool called a kubel, a bucket suspended from a crane, able to unload 200 gallons of concrete in less than a minute. It takes 20 kubels to pour the entire hull. Crews begin with the walls. We're gonna be dumping kubel all day. Unlike a typical foundation where the walls are built of the exact same thickness, workers build these walls with varying thicknesses up to five inches. So, Kurt, for example, why are the two wall thicknesses different? This side's thinner than that side. Uh, sometimes the people are going to live in it. They tell us, I want to uh, put a bed on that corner. So the homeowners actually tell you where the bed's going to go, where the TV's going to go, where the sofa's going to go. And based upon the weight of those objects, yeah. you can counterbalance that by thickening a concrete wall or thinning another. Yeah. With the entire hull poured, workers then fuse the walls and floor together to create a watertight seal by vibrating the concrete. The size of floating buildings in Amsterdam is limited not by their height, but instead by their width, dictated by the very system keeping the city dry, the over 50 miles of canals and 20 locks. The homes have to travel 30 miles from the factory, across a lake, through four miles of canals, and two sets of locks, just to get to Iberg. Designing houses thin enough to fit through 20-foot wide locks solves one challenge, but also creates another. Engineers design the structures in two sections, individually able to fit through the locks, but when attached, the size of the base doubles, making a single building 10 times more stable. Until they're attached, the two halves are susceptible to tipping. So workers have to be extremely careful when floating the sections for the first time, starting when they flood the dry dock with 12,000 gallons of water. Once the house begins to rise, crews lift the steel gate, dividing the wet dock from the dry dock. After an hour of filling the dry dock, Crews are now ready to move the 140-ton house into the wet dock by attaching it to a tugboat. We're gonna hop in a boat, connect it, and literally drag the house right out. The home has to be raised five feet to avoid scraping the floor. With the house floating, it's tipping beyond the safe limit of four degrees. Because engineers designed the house to hold over half a ton of furniture, when it's empty, crews have to compensate for that missing weight. Look at this, that's crazy. They do that by temporarily adding ballast to the basement, which makes it stable enough to move. Using 10, 400 pound barrels, the crew levels the home just enough to move it to the wet dock. Floating five feet above the floor, 
The house is docked, and the crew starts the prep work for its eight-hour journey to Amsterdam. While it takes three years to create islands and then build homes, the floating homes can be built and installed in just four months. But unlike the land-based homes, they face a challenge unique to building on water. Situated side by side, water constantly pushes on the homes with a thousand pounds of force, causing the two halves to move independently. Over time, it can damage the hull and the home. So to prevent them from rubbing, engineers leave a one-inch gap between the halves, affixing them in three places with steel plates on the top, middle, and underneath, creating a structure that pushes against the water as a solid, single unit. To eliminate friction between the homes, we're now connecting a steel plate to both hulls with three bolts on either side. The team on the surface acts as a second pair of eyes, making sure the installation is done correctly. And look at this. As you can see right here, this steel bolt with three bolts on one side and three bolts on the other is now on the two buildings, and the two buildings are sealed as one solid homogenous floating object. The floating homes of Eiberg use no piles at all. Just two steel mooring poles drilled 20 feet into the lake bed. But unlike their land building counterparts, engineers of floating homes face a specific challenge, seasickness. Typically, a boat is moored by tying it to the dock in two places on the same side. But this generates a sway that is nearly twice the tolerated level. The solution, moor the homes using two 10-foot poles one in the front, and the other diagonally in the back. This specific configuration secures the home by preventing it from rocking side to side. All right, let's more a house. Crews first attach the bracket to the home's concrete foundation, but the constant movement of the house could cause the bracket to shift up to half a foot. So to prevent this, the team applies a chemical adhesive that tightly bonds the bracket to the foundation. So in order to make sure that this steel becomes a permanent addition to the concrete foundation, I'm gonna insert this glass vial with an adhesive inside it into the hole. We're then gonna have, excuse me, Raymond, a bolt that's angled like this, like a blade, which will smash the glass vial, mix up the adherent, and fuse the steel to the concrete for good. All right, coming in, Raymond. Oh! With the brackets in place, they now have to move the house to the mooring pole. You got, those. you got that set, okay. The crew now attaches the remaining brackets. Hey, here she comes. Okay. <laughs> There's very little room doing this, obviously. I'm oh, sorry, Raymond. All right, with this fourth and final bolt tightened, this floating home is not going anywhere, thanks to two incredible gentlemen, my friend Marcel and the always talented Raymond. Give me some skin, baby. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Good stuff. It's interesting, so the previous generation of Holland really had to battle and manage the water. Yeah. And this new generation wants to actually enjoy it. Yes. Engage yes. with the water. What's very interesting is the old generation, uh, they knew how dangerous the water was. But the new generation is very well protected. The people are not enjoying it only. With nearly all the 150 floating homes in Eiberg sold, its success has spawned more projects across Amsterdam. And in 10 years, 45,000 people will live on Amsterdam's new expansion project.